Hello everybody, you have tuned in to Eric Jose on Making a Murderer on YouTube. I cover virtually any aspect of Making a Murderer. I go over the evidence, the documents, the photos. So if you'd like, stay tuned and in the future I'll have many more videos besides the one you're about to see. Hello everybody out there in MAM land. Back today with a little bit more of Zellner's filing. This particular bit is dealing with the um, the expert that she has brought in to testify and illustrate how much prosecu prosecutorial misconduct took place in this case. And that person's name is Bennett Gershman. And very, very interesting. Um, everything that, that Bennett has to say is pretty interesting. And I will also say reminds me very much of what, uh, you know, former prosecutor Robert Milan said in the, um, in the uh, video, A True Story of a False Confession um, about Brendan. He in that, in that, I'm going to play some clips from it so you guys could see it. So anyways, to all the people out there at the rallies, the rallies are going on this weekend. So to all the people out at the rallies, you know, great. Get out there, show your support. Um, that's awesome. And I uh, hope you guys all have fun. So we're going to move into what we're doing here. So the first part we're going to, first thing we're going to, you know, go into here is why are we listening to this Bennett Gershman? Who is this Bennett Gershman? Why should we? Why should we be listening to anything that this person has to say? What makes them so special, right? Okay. First thing we're going to look at here is basically going to tell you Mr. Uh, Mr. Gershman's history and, and, and all of the, you know, basically all the jobs that Mr. Gershman has held and how those things kind of uniquely qualify him for this exact type of situation. So we'll move into that document right now. We'll see you in a few. This is where Mr. Uh, Gershman is talking about his background and experience. I have had considerable experience as a prosecutor, defense attorney, and academic. I served as an assistant district attorney in the office of the New York County District Attorney from 1966 to 1972, where I was assigned to the homicide rackets, appeals, and major felony bureaus. I, present, I presented hundreds of cases to grand juries and tried numerous felony cases to verdict. I served also as an assistant attorney general in the office of the New York State Prose Special Prosecutor's Office from 1972 to 1976, which was established to investigate and prosecute official and political corruption in New York City's criminal justice system. I was chief of the Appeals Bureau and of the Bronx Anti-Corruption Bureau, where I investigated cases, presented cases to special grand juries, and prosecuted many public officials, including judges, prosecutors, attorneys, police officers, and other public officials that, that were corrupt or fraudulent. I am currently a tenured professor at the, of law at the Elizabeth Hobbs School of Law at Pace. University, where I have taught since 1976. I teach courses in criminal law, criminal procedure, and constitutional law, evidence, trial practice, and professional ethics. During my academic career, I have served as a defense attorney, representing many persons charged with serious felonies, including murder, rape, organized crime, and drug cases. I have represented clients before federal and state grand juries. I am frequently consulted as an expert on criminal procedure, prosecutorial misconduct, and professional ethics. I have had I have have testified as an expert witness in judicial proceedings and before the United States Congress, the New York State Legislature, and various professional and fact-finding commissions. Okay, so we're all on board with now why we we are listening to this guy and why what he has to say may actually be of worth, right? Because well, this is what he did. This is how he practiced as an attorney was by chasing down corrupt political f officials and uh, judges, prosecutors, lawyers, anybody, you know, other uh, elected, you know, offices or, or public offices, publicly held offices and things like that. That was what he did. It's what he specialized in. And he is, as he said, often sought out for his expertise in prosecutorial misconduct cases. So that's why what this man has to say is important. And so 
now we're going to move into where he now begins to talk about. Obviously, I'm not going to go through everything he says, but I'm going to hit the high points here. We're going to move right to where he talks about uh, March 1st and March 2nd when King Kratz did the press conference. So we're going to see what this gentleman has to say about King Kratz's little press conference and, and theatrics there. So here we go. Kratz held several press conferences in connection with the Avery case, but two are notable on March 1st, 2006 and March 2nd, 2006. Given the sensational nature of the case, which Kratz called the largest criminal investigation that anybody, that anybody has ever talked about, Kratz was obviously aware that anything he said would have had powerful impact on public opinion about the case. Thus, on March 1st, Several months after Avery had originally been charged with the Halbach murder, Kratz announced significant developments in the case. He told the large throng of media attendees that law enforcement now has a definitive set of answers as to what happened to Teresa Halbach. <clears throat> he asserted that as he was speaking, a, a search warrant was simultaneously being executed on the Avery premises and that we know exactly what to look for and where to look for it. Kratz ended the press conference by inviting the media to a second press conference the following day in which he intim intimated there would be a stunning announcement. Well, let's see what Robert Milan thinks about this situation. I looked at this, I, like the dean, I did a crash course on making a murder this week. I watched all 10 episodes in three separate days and I found myself screaming at the television and, and, and screaming at, mis at Mr. Kratz like the rest of you. And, and as I broke this thing down, this is how I looked at it. It's, uh, it started out with the conflict of interest. I mean, how did this whole thing start going south? That they were wise enough to call in a special prosecutor, a moronic special prosecutor, but they, <laughs> they, they brought in a special prosecutor, but they weren't wise enough to keep the original cops out of this. Um, and that's shocking. So that's how this whole thing starts going sideways. Followed by Kratz's press conference, regarding Mr. Dassey's confession, which was outrageous, followed by the fact that Kratz commits a huge discovery violation by questioning Bobby Dassey during the trial about a, a statement that the defense attorneys never heard about before, um, followed by the defense attorney for Brendan Kaczynski absolutely selling him out with the investigator Following, followed by a series of rulings by the judge that were outrageous. One, no gag order. I mean, why prosecutors and defense attorneys are stepping up to cameras after every day of trial is beyond me. Um, and then followed by what I already mentioned, which was zero corroboration to substantiate the confession. Yeah, you gotta love that guy, Robert Milan, man. He's freaking aces. He's He is absolutely stellar. So... Here we go. The next day, March 2nd, Kratz held the press conference after warning children not to watch. Kratz related to a huge assembled media and a live television audience the, the horrific details in Brendan Dassey's confession and how he was invited into Avery's trailer, saw Teresa Halbach naked, and shackled to Avery's bed, and how he and Avery repeatedly raped, tortured, and gruesomely butchered her to death. Kratz's sensational presentation was based exclusively on Brendan Dassey's confession. Kratz knew that there was no evidence to corroborate Dassey's confession and implicate Stephen Avery. Even though the police for the previous four months had exhaustively searched Avery's trailer, garage, and other parts of his property, Kratz also knew that this, was, that this new account of the rape, torture, murder of Teresa Halbach contradicted virtually every fact Kratz had alleged in his original criminal complaint against Avery and placed the place where Teresa Halbach was killed, the garage, the weapon used, the gun, the cause of death, gunshots to the head. Kratz asserted that have now deter we have now determined what occurred sometime between 3.45 p.m. and 10 or 11 p.m. on the 31st of October. He then proceeded to recount for the media, the viewing audience, and ultimately a nation nationwide audience the following allegations. Avery, Avery, partially dressed and full of sweat, you know, we all know that one, invites Dassey, his 16-year-old nephew, into the trailer. Teresa Halbach, completely naked and shackled to the bed, screams louder and louder for help. 
Avery invites Dassey to sexually assault Hobok, telling him that he is re he has repeatedly sexually assaulted her. Dassey proceeds to sexually assault Teresa Hobok, who begged him, who begged the 16-year-old for help. Avery watches as his 16-year-old nephew raped this woman. Avery compl compliments Brendan on what a good job he did. Avery tells Brendan of his intent to murder Teresa Hallback. Brendan watches as Stephen Avery takes a butcher knife from the kitchen and stabs Teresa Hallback in the stomach. A butcher knife, by the way, that they never found any trace of anything on. They And, and trust me, they pulled every single knife out of that place and not, they didn't find anything. Brendan cuts Teresa Hallback's throat, but she still doesn't die, and Avery and Dassey together sadistically inflict on Teresa Hallback additional torture, additional mutilation, additional mechanisms of death, which include manual strangulation and gunshot wounds. Kratz concluded the press conference by expressing low har how heartbroken he was to tell Teresa Hallback's family the fate of Teresa. Kratz ended by stating that, as we sit here today, the individual that knew Teresa will remember the individuals that knew Teresa will remember her, this extraordinary woman and the joy that she brought. Kratz's statements at this press conference constituted professional misconduct. Kratz, an experienced prosecutor, knew a prosecutor is not allowed to disparage the character and reputation of an accused, disclose the existence of a confession or the physical evidence, discuss any information that is likely to be inadmissible in evidence, and if disclosed would create a substantial risk of prejudicing an impartial trial and express an, an opinion on a defendant's guilt. Kratz knew that, this sta that the, his statements would make it virtually impossible for anyone watching his press conference to keep an open mind about the case and the guilt of the defendants. Kratz knew what he had accomplished. In a subsequent interview, he stated, I was hoping the media would not choose to release all of the disturbing details. Kratz knew that his statement would have a substantial likelihood of materially prejudicing an adjudicative proceeding and a substantial likelihood of heightening public condemnation of the accused. Moreover, although a prosecutor is barred from expressing any opinion on the merits of a case and the guilt of an accused, Kratz bolstered his grisly description of the crime by representing that everything he said was a truthful and accurate account. He asserted in his March 1st press conference that the law enforcement now has a definitive set of answers as to what happened at, to Teresa Halbach, and the law enforcement is presently executing a search warrant on the Avery property where we know exactly what to look for and where to look for it. Then, at his press conference the next day, Kratz assures, assured his listeners that we have now determined what occurred sometime between 3.45 p.m. and 10 or 11 p.m. on October 31st. Finally, Kratz's statements were likely to be accepted by the public as truths. More than any other government official, a prosecutor is viewed by the public with esteem and trust. The public looks to the prosecutor as the official most responsible for vindicating the rule of law and punishing wrongdoers. Given Kratz's prestige and prominence as the special prosecutor appointed by the governor to lead the investigation, Kratz's assertions that law enforcement had solved the case would almost certainly be greeted by the public with both relief that the public perpetrators had been apprehended and an outcry to punish them. Okay, so what Mr. Gershman here is building to here but you know he's building to but he's also talking about the press conference because of how much the you know Ken Kratz just completely muddied the water made it where it was impossible almost pretty much almost impossible to feel the jury there that would be open-minded and but the more important thing that he's setting up here is the fact that Ken Kratz did that press conference like that full well knowing he couldn't use it at trial for Steven he couldn't use it for Steven okay and the fact that he was doing that was creating the ability for him to educate his future jurors of of something he wanted them to be aware of but that he couldn't present in court and that is what this gentleman mr. Gershman is basically pointing out that he that he that is his opinion of what Kratz was trying to pull right here 
Okay, so this is going to be the end of part one. I'm going to go ahead and, and, and stop it right here. And go ahead and be ready. You know, you can go to part two right after this one if you want. I'll even leave a link for you right below in the, in the info down below. So um, we'll see you. If you haven't already, please hit subscribe.